Okay. Uh, hi, um, my name is Alok. I work at ID Device. Uh, I think it's become a mandatory plug now. Uh, we're hiring, so do get in touch with me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about unikernels. Uh, the original intention of this talk was I, I would, you know, actually have something to show you and I could get into some technical details, but uh, that didn't happen. So I have a bunch of insights and perhaps we can talk about those things. <coughs> Um, so, I'd like to start off by setting up, you know, the problem statement. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, running things at scale or whatever it is. Everything breaks, everything, no matter what you do, it's going to break. Uh, building a predictable self-regulating system, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, large variations in load, like the kind of thing that Vinay was talking about earlier, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't hear it back? Is this better? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, the kind of thing that Vinay was talking about earlier, you know, 25x spike, that's really hard to engineer against. It's really, really hard to have something that can handle 25 times load, 100 times load. It's really, really hard to handle, uh, both in terms of cost, complexity of the system that you have to deploy. You saw that deployment diagram that uh, Vinay came up, and that's, that's the level of engineering that goes into it. You can achieve reliability by code, you can achieve it by process by skill of the people who do it and maturity, how many times you've done this before. And the one learning from that really is that don't use a human to do a machine's job. Like there's some things which are repetitive and all that and that's best left to machine. Try not to do, uh, not, try not do this or engineer this sort of reliability on the basis of people. Um, you have a bunch of balances that you need to get to, so reliability versus agility. Agility again, it's something that's nice, sounds nice, but it's pretty difficult to quantify it. But pretty much every business, and I'm guessing last number of the businesses were here, um, they need it. They need it to succeed because things change. Things change really quickly. And the last one is complexity versus metrics. You can build a very complex system. That means that you don't really have a good handle on whether at any given point in time, how is my system? Am I running out of capacity? Am I underutilizing capacity? Could I move things? Could I do things better? Because there are lots and lots of, you know, things in the picture. There's uh, network flows, there's uh, application, you know, CPU usage, databases. Uh, you need to put all of these things together and come up with like a quantifiable thing, something that you can look at in real time, something that you can understand in real time. So that's the other balance that you need to get to. So as you can see, the problems of running web scale applications or even your own small little product that needs to do this, that it's, it's hard to do. So current technology that you have that we're talking about, for that I mean Docker, LXC, CHROOTS, whatever. The, uh, lots of other talks on those things, so I'll just leave that to those talks. Um, so for this, basically you have to build the images yourself. The building of your images I mean, it's really up to you, but I mean, with the five eyes and you can't really trust anything that you download from the internet. So you got to build your own images. That has its own set of you know, challenges that you need to build. And the biggest thing that I, the biggest practical problem is that when you're talking about, you know, images of the order of gigabytes, then that's, that brings in a huge number of problems. Like you can use innovative things like Facebook, for instance, they deploy code uh, over BitTorrent. Now that's great, but when something goes wrong or some particular part's not getting updated, I, I'd imagine that it would be a bugger to you know, debug this and find out what exactly is happening. Um, and you need to do stuff like this when you're talking about images size of gigabytes. And the amount of density that you can achieve, like given X amount of compute power, that is CPUs, RAM, storage, whatever, 
you can get pretty much the same amount of density via containers um, as you get with VMs, shroots. Um, and the attack surface is the same. In fact, probably a little more because in one server you are running copies. So, you have the same amount of attack surface. So, for instance, if uh, there is a shell shock bug and your application does not really use bash in any way whatsoever, um, but you still need to apply those updates, otherwise you are going to have a problem. And you basically with the current technology what you have is you are adding one more layer to the mix. And by layers I mean, so you start off with the hardware right at the bottom and on top of that you have the hypervisor. On top of that you have your OS or your kernel, whatever you want to call it. On top of that you have your runtime, that is whatever your Python runtime, your Go runtime, whatever that is. Um, then you have your configuration on top of that. On top of that you have your application. So now basically you will add one more thing in between say your hypervisor and OS kernel, there will be this sort of you know container thing that also sits in there. So you are adding one more layer to an already quite a layered mix. So with unikernels, uh, basically boil, boil them all down to three layers. You have hardware, you have a hypervisor, which provides two functions for you. One, your power envelope. So basically your hypervisor knows how to deal with your hardware. So supposing you were running on ARM hardware, the hypervisor would know how to you know, handle the power envelope there. And the other thing would the hypervisor would provide you is resource isolation. So you would run a bunch of applications on top of that and some of these applications need to keep you know, isolated from each other. Um, so this is an extreme view of unikernels. So Docker, I mean container technology I believe is just a step along this path. So I am just taking a way out from left field type of view and trying to see like what we can do with that right now. Uh, so currently what you have with unikernels, see, the state of the art, so you have two different, you have two types of uh, unikernels uh, and I, th this slide specifically I would like to give the credit out to um, this person called Mark Bojoloy, uh, there is a credit slide right at the end. So I, I, I came up with this slide based, basically based on his work because I really haven't tried out all these things. Um, so you have two types of kernels basically, you, I can, you can call them thin and fat. So thin, you could consider them specialized, you know, single, you know, you have a very well defined application, you want to do that. So that sort of thing applies here. And fat are, you know, more traditional. They, most of these things, at least BSD RUM kernels for instance, they aspire to something like POSIX. So your existing applications could, could, could run on this. Um, so some of these like link, uh, drawbridge, drawbridge is this new thing that is coming out from Microsoft of all things, available on Azure if you want to try it out, great. Uh, Ling, OSV, Boxfuser, these are three that I know for a fact are available in EC2. Boxfuser is actually another sort of integrator. Uh, so you can go out to their site and if you have like Java applications, you can get it down to that. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, um, way back in the day there was talk of you know Sun building the Java VM right into their process. This is basically the same thing, but instead of having to build a Java VM processor, you would have like a unicorn, a Java runtime that runs down there. Uh, there is lots of stuff, there is lots of real world things that have been done with Mirage OS, OCaml. In fact, there is this person out at the University of Cambridge who has done a bunch of stuff and they have come up with, um, uh, they had released something recently called Jitsu, just in time summoning of unicorns. <coughs> um, Erlang is something that is particularly suited to this sort of, this mode of uh, building applications. So that is something that uh, you should, you could take a look at as well if that is something that you are interested in. Um, so some, now I, I, these two slides which have unikernel, you know, the pluses and the minuses, but as pretty much everybody knows, there is no such thing as, you know, an advantage. Every advantage can be a disadvantage, you just need to look at it differently. Um, so one thing, the first thing that I can come up with, you have images are usually of the order of megabytes, sometimes even kilobytes. You are in control of performance because you control everything, you do not have uh, 
generic TCP offload in your Linux kernel which is doing something and you don't really know what, what's happening in there. So you, you know exactly what's happening. Order of magnitude in, uh, increase in density. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, Teen Pati game that you can play on Facebook. It's provided by this company called Octro. So they use Erlang and they've got, they support twice the number of users per server than WhatsApp does. And WhatsApp, I mean, exchanging messages, yeah, and images and all that, reasonably complex. But there's a lot of computation that need, you need to do in, in Dinpati. It's not just, you know, sending, um, you know, dump IO here and there. So, and with that level of thing, they've achieved twice the density. Um, deployments that you can reason about primarily because your application is now aware of deployment. It's aware of like how it's running. It has to be. It has to be aware. Otherwise, it's not just. It's just not going to work in this sort of thing. So your applications can sort of handle large amounts of load balancing. These sort of functions right in the application layer itself, which means that you can do more efficient load balancing. Attack surface is reduced. Way way reduced. Um, for instance, you don't have all the craft that comes along with a big container image or something like that. You don't have any of those things. Um, so basically your attack surface is basically going to be your application and stuff that happens in there. Um, everyone needs to be a complete engineer. I, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So the first three primarily talk about efficiency. This one is just a, the KISS principle. This one's about security. And all of these, you could, you, you could take this whole slide and just make it unicals and minus minus, and I could bring up another set of things about that, which is this one. So morphing existing applications non-trivial. In fact, it's not really something that's going to happen. It makes sense for you know greenfield projects, stuff that you're starting out from scratch now, but existing deployments, uh, you've got a lot of baggage that you have carried along. Maybe not. And some software infra, like databases, like supposing you use an RDBMS, Oracle, Postgres, things like that, uh, you might not find you know, good solutions for that. Um, now, I told you that you, know, you can get order of magnitude increases in density. That also means that hardware failures, if you, the hardware that's running something, if that fails, it takes out more of your capacity than it used to before. Resource isolation is kind of tricky because you're kind of depending on uh, the hypervisor. The first few implementations of uh, Mirage OS uh, and LibOS, uh, they had like problems, you know, fundamental design problems with resource isolation. It's getting better, but you know how it is, right? Uh, it's impossible to guarantee that uh, these sort of resources can be kept isolated, uh, that there is no data leakage between them because finally these things are running on the same same bit of hardware, so it's it's not it's not easy to guarantee those things. Um, and thin unikernels might not really be ready for prime time yet. I don't know of you know very many people. Octro was actually the first people that I found out who were running this sort of thing in in production successfully. So uh, I don't I'm not entirely sure about the prime time thing. Everybody needs to be a rounded engineer. This, I think, is one of the big problems, is that you can't operate at your abstract level of the framework that you're working with. You can't be like a web developer. A web developer needs to know what the TCP stack's about, because that's, what is, that's what's being demanded of you when you start writing stuff with unikernels. That could be an advantage, could be a disadvantage, depending on how you, how you like to look at it. Um, the, some of the applications that have used unikernels, um, virtualized network functions. Um, so these guys, so basically what you have is you have your hardware load balancer or whatever. Uh, you want to virtualize it. Uh, the, the easy way, you write you the equivalent C code of whatever it is and run it on Linux. But uh, they, there's this click OS which is primarily about you know, uh, network interfaces and I.O. And it has a bunch of things that you can you can offload a lot of you know uh, packet arrangement into 
so it provides you some primitives for that. So a bunch of virtualized network functions like uh, F5's load balancers um, uh, and um, I can't remember the other ones, but there are a bunch of virtual network functions which use click OS and uh, are delivering, they're being sold right now. Um, SOA, uh, service oriented architecture based on microservices, it works, it works quite, quite well in this sort of thing. Um, you can build persistent services, so the kind of thing that I was talking about earlier, databases. Uh, so they might not have like good um, solutions in the Unicorn world, but you can build a different type of persistent service. So persistent services are things like databases, they primarily rely on I.O. So you can have a two-tier thing, so you can have your application talking to a bunch of storage right at the bottom, and that is your persistent layer. So you could in theory, you could build like a two-tier NoSQL thing, and you could have you could generate infinite scale from it. Uh, network services like VPNs, lots of things, uh, lots of existing people you do use unicorns for this sort of uh, this sort of thing. Um, so I have these are some credits that I have uh, uh, of particular relevance. So I'm putting any links and stuff like that. Google's good enough for that. So these are the two guys who have done a bunch of stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, Matt Bajor has a really nice presentation uh, about unicorns if you want to look at it more. So I kind of, you know, this is more blue sky stuff, things that I do all <laughs> when I'm out of the office, you know, sitting on flights and stuff like that. So I've left a little bit of time uh, to hear what you guys have to, you know, say about it. And if you have any comments, questions, that sort of thing.